Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Gabriella True and I'm president of Aspire, which stands for Alliance to Solve PANS and PANDAS and immune related encephalopathies. Um, we, our mission is to improve the lives of children and adults affected by PANS, PANDAS and related encephalopathies. We have five core audiences in order to do that. And we focus of course on the general public and increasing understanding and awareness. We work with families and patients in order to um, provide them support that they need with our one-on-one -on -one support, our Facebook group, um, family stories, webinars such as this, and our toolkits. We spend a lot of time working with schools. Um, it's our slow time in the summer with that, but soon it'll get kicked up. Um, we offer in services to school staff and to school nurses on PANS Pandas. We provide toolkits and other handouts, um, and our website articles are constantly being updated. We do work to work on public policy. We work with different state leads, um, boots on the ground. We provide letters of testimony, and we spend a lot of time talking to legislators. And of course, we have toolkits and some state services surveys. Um, we also provide support to researchers and physicians, we know that they don't have a lot of time in their day either. And so we provide toolkits and handouts that they can in turn give to their patients. So they can't always spend as much time as they'd like explaining some of the bases and doing some of that one-on-one -on -one support. So we work with them on that. And then we also have toolkits and handouts for provider education. Um, and now, of course, we have these webinars, which we have divided into different categories um, so that we can have more than one webinar a month, um, if that's how the schedule goes. Um, and so today we are so honored to have Dr. Ingalls come speak to us on low-dose immunotherapy, which is a novel treatment for PANS. Um, like I said, in while we're getting ready, um, at first you're like, what is LDI? And he will explain it and he, I couldn't possibly do it myself. Um, he does a much better job of it. And he's a wonderful doctor. Um, I have a lot of people who um, are treated by him and with great success. And he is a licensed naturopathic physician. He's the author of a wonderful book um, and he speaks to groups like ours and other ones across the country and internationally. He um, has successfully treated himself with Lyme um, after years of just doing the regular mainstream medicine approach. He really wasn't getting a lot better. And he says, you know, there's gotta be more to this. There's something else I can do. So with his naturopathic um, medicine and lifestyle changes and diet, he has successfully recovered from Lyme. And in doing that, he has been able to take that knowledge, um, that firsthand knowledge and his years of practical medicine and in helping his patients in turn. And one of the treatments that he does use is LDI, which he will talk about today. Um, and so we're really, I'm so glad to have him talk today. I've wanted him to speak for different um, things that I've been involved in over the years and I finally got it to happen. So I feel like this has been a long time coming and he's been very patient with me. So he kept saying, I'm gonna get you to do it one day. And he's like, okay, Gabriella. And so I was really excited when I finally got to ask. And so he's definitely one of the first people we've had in our new series on the integrative treatments. And so without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let Dr. Ingle share his and stop share there we go all right well thank you gabriella and let me just queue up my screen here so tonight i'm going to talk with you about low dose immunotherapy and uh, you know this is a therapy that's now been around for about maybe eight years and has really been a game changer for a lot of the patients i work with as a sort of unique way to help modulate the immune system. So let's dive right in. And I think you need a little bit of a history lesson first to kind of understand where LDI came from and why it works the way it does. So going back to the 1960s, there was a, a doctor out of the UK, Dr. Len McHugh, and he was an ENT, 
ENT doctor, ear, nose, and throat. And he was actually trying to treat nasal polyps, which is a common problem for people to get chronic allergies. And he discovered that there's an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. It's actually found in your white blood cells, so it's something your body has seen before. He was actually using a different enzyme called hyaluronidase, and I forget why somehow the hyaluronidase and beta-glucuronidase got mixed up. But what he found is that when people were getting these injections of beta-glucuronidase, it seemed to help turn off their reaction to different allergens. So he started mixing it with very highly diluted extracts of, of allergies, you know, ragweed and dust and so forth. And he called this enzyme potentiated desensitization, the enzyme being the beta-glucuronidase. And if you think of like about allergy shots, you know, allergy shots, if you go to conventional allergist and you go get your injections every week, they're desensitizing you to dust and mold and ragweed, you know, whatever your allergy might be. Well, the concept is really kind of similar, but the big difference is dose. The dilution that's used here is way, way, way more dilute than you would get from a conventional allergist. So again, he, he sort of accidentally again kind of found that this is a gentler way of you know modulating these allergic responses. And to put it in perspective, you know, EPD uh, is a way of again building immune tolerance. If you look at allergy at its core, it is a loss of immune tolerance. Your immune system is designed to recognize what's part of your world, what's not part of your world. When it loses that ability to understand what's part of your world, we call that a loss of immune tolerance. And again, we could have a whole nother complete discussion about what causes loss of immune tolerance. To be honest, in most cases, we don't really know. But nonetheless, when you start becoming reactive or hypersensitive to everything around you, then your immune system gets primed to become, again, more hypersensitive. And therefore, when you have that exposure, the reaction can be quite drastic. So the amount that we use in, in EPD, and it's now been called something different, it was called LDA or low-dose allergy therapy, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But it's anywhere from 10 to the negative 7 to 10 to the negative 14. So basically, that's 1 to a million to 1 to, you know, hundreds of millions. Whereas when you get conventional allergy shots, they use one to 100, one to 1,000 dilution. So the dilution, again, is much, much more dilute than you would get in conventional allergy shots. It is not homeopathic, by the way, uh, exactly, uh, at least in those dilutions. You're getting very close to it, but not quite there yet. So again, these low doses of these allergy extracts mixed with the beta-glucuronidase seem to help modulate what's called Treg cells or T-regulatory cells. And these are really the conductors of the immune system. So we're kind of retraining these cells to tell the rest of your immune system what should be turned on and what should be turned off. So again, we were using EPD up until really the late 1980s. Uh, our fabulous FDA at the time kind of pitched to fit because all these extracts were being imported from the UK. They didn't like that. So uh, Dr. Butch Schrader, who's a medical doctor out of Santa Fe, New Mexico, he had trained with Dr. McEwen and he was bringing it over to the US. And when the FDA stopped the importation, he redeveloped it here in the United States, basically remade the mixes so they didn't have to be imported. They couldn't call it EPD because that was something else. So they just renamed it LDA or low dose allergy therapy. It's really the exact same thing. So if you just happen to go online and you read about this, they really are the same. So LDA was made by a pharmacy. There's a food mix, an inhalant mix, which had mold, pollen, dust, animal danders, and then a chemical mix. And to date, I mean, there's been hundreds of thousands of doses given of LDA slash EPD worldwide, and no reports of anaphylaxis, severe reactions. So a very safe therapy to use for various types of different types of allergies. In fact, we even use it for people that have anaphylactic reactions. If your you know, child has an anaphylactic reaction to peanuts or other you know, foods in the conventional medical world, often they do nothing. They just say, you know, keep an EpiPen on hand and don't ever let your child eat the food. There are some allergy clinics now that are doing what's called oral immunotherapy, where you go in you know, frequently and they start giving you small amounts of peanut. They're trying to build your immune tolerance. And again, that does work for a lot of people. Uh, but a lot of allergists don't want to touch it because obviously you know, there is a risk of having a bad reaction and some clinics just don't want to deal with it. But the, the LDA being so highly diluted, um, it just doesn't seem to trigger that kind of reaction. So about eight years ago, Dr. Ty Vincent, he's a medical doctor in uh, Kona, Hawaii. Dr. Vincent was actually up in Anchorage, Alaska for many, many years and then decided he was tired of the cold and <laughs> relocated to Hawaii. But he had been doing LDA in his practice and he realized that 
our bodies were reacting very similarly to bacteria and viruses and other microbes much in the same way that it was reacting to food or mold or pollen. So he kind of postulated that, well, if it's the same immune reaction and if LDA helps work for foods and mold and pollen, why wouldn't it work for a microbe? And I, I believe the first person he treated, he gave strep to. Uh, and, you know, strep has been a, a well-documented trigger for autoimmune disease, causes rheumatic fever, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, or excuse me, rheumatic heart disease, uh, pans, and of course, so many other things. So he treated somebody with dead strep, and you can buy these extracts that are dead microbe. They're irradiated, so they can't reproduce, they can't cause illness. Uh, but they contain all the little proteins and antigens we need to help manipulate the immune system. And just like giving the LDA, it was a diluted amount of strep mixed with beta-glucuronidase, squirted under the tongue, and he found that his patient had a very favorable response. So at the end of the day, again, the immune mechanisms are really kind of the same. So with, with LDI now, you know, where I say LDA isn't really homeopathic, LDI is kind of migrated, and we realize that some people do need those higher dilutions. So at some point, some of these dilutions are truly homeopathic, which means that if you take it to a lab and you try to analyze it, they can't measure any detectable piece of strep or whatever might be left in it. So with LDI, you know, it's anywhere from 10 to the fifth up to 10 to negative 48. Um, so that's definitely beyond that point where, you know, there's nothing left in it. So it's the residual, you know, effect of that dilution that seems to have the effect. So clearly there's more than just a straight physiological impact of LDI. There seems to be some sort of element of bioenergetic effect. And however you want to qualify or quantify that, you know, in much the way that, you know, homeopathy as a whole works, how does acupuncture work, these things that we don't, you know, really have kind of a defined mechanism. Uh, I, I don't know that we completely understand it, but, you know, clinically we see both positive and negative reactions at these homeopathic dilutions of these different bugs. So we know it's changing the body in some way. And of course, we're shooting for a positive way, but every now and then we do have people that have adverse reactions. And even an adverse reaction is showing that we are touching something. And that's not always a bad thing. And again, I'll explain that a little bit more in just a few minutes. So again, these are inactivated microbial nosodes. They're dead bug mixed with the enzyme. And again, we administer it under the tongue. So the reason this works is we know immunologically there's a concept uh, called molecular mimicry. And what that means is that there's something on the surface, more often of the microbe, that may be structurally very similar to something that's in our own tissue. And whether that's something that's found in our brain, found in our joints, found in our gut, found in our skin, it really could be anything. So as your immune system amps up to fight whatever that microbe is, it accidentally starts interacting with our own tissue. And of course, in the pace, a case of PANS, you can imagine if that tissue happens to be anything related to the brain or the nervous system, you're going to get, you know, some sort of neurological effect. So, you know, these activated T cells and B cells, and, you know, T cells are your direct scavengers, of the immune system, but certain types of T cells stimulate B cells to make antibodies. And between the two, they again, they just start cross-reacting with our own tissue, and that's what leads to this change in cell, cell activity, and ultimately that's what we see in terms of symptoms. So it's that loss of tolerance much in the same way. And you know, we know from PANS that a lot of things that are triggers are normal parts of our ecology. It may be something that's normally found in our gut, it could be found in our nose or throat or even on our skin. So again, it's not like these are foreign bugs that the body's never seen before, but something has changed that now the immune system's looking at that and seeing it as something foreign versus something that's really part of our own body. So we have this idea that there's one microbe that might cause any number of different illnesses. So again, strep, you know, strep pyogenes, group A strep. This is the one we most often think of pandas, but it causes rheumatic fever. It's associated with a certain type of psoriasis called guttate psoriasis. Pandas, chronic fatigue, recurrent tonsillitis. It can even cause kidney problems or what's called glomerulonephritis. So this one bug has the potential again to interact and cause 
damage to any number of other different tissues. Conversely, you can have one disease or one condition that might be caused by any number of other different microbes. I mean, psoriasis, psoriasis could be related to a food reaction. It could be due to strep. It could be staph. It could be bacteroides. It could be maybe mycobacterial viruses. So when you look at any one condition, I would never assume that there's one microbe causing that one condition. And indeed, we find that for any one condition, there may be multiple microbes that are potential triggers. So ultimately our goal is that we're trying to restore this immune tolerance that's been lost, that thing that's you know poking the bear and making your immune system unhappy. We wanna try and reestablish that tolerance so your immune system says, hey, look, I know you're part of my world, leave it alone. I live with you, you live with me, and we don't bother each other. Once we improve that immune tolerance, we can break that cycle because ultimately the end product of that is inflammation. And if that inflammation happens to occur in the brain, brain on fire is never a good thing. And that's why we see, you know, PANS and all these other, you know, various neurological effects. So, you know, how do we know which antigen to use? How do we know which microbe? Well, in some cases, it's based on the symptoms or disease condition. We might have evidence from, you know, different lab work. I mean, if someone has sky high strep titers on a blood test, maybe they did an organic acid test and their clostridium markers are high or their yeast markers are high. So we can use, you know, labs as a marker of what have you been exposed to? It certainly doesn't prove that's what's causing the problem. And I'll present a case in a little bit where I got completely bamboozled and I thought it was one thing and ended up being something completely different. But again, as a practitioner, it at least gives us an idea about where do we need to start? Of course, any kind of previous history of infection, you know, I've had patients that had, you know, recurrent strep throat when they were little, now they're older and they don't get strep throat anymore, but that doesn't mean that the immune system couldn't have been sensitized to strep. Uh, Lyme, of course, people have had Lyme disease in the past, that can be a trigger. And again, really any other number of microbes are potential triggers. And you know, which body fluid captures that antigen? You know, uh, you know, I have a lot of people, again, who get pandas who don't get strep throat. They keep getting culture in their throat over and over. They're always negative. But again, you do a blood test and, you know, the blood test is sky high. So this is just kind of a, a, an example of kind of what we know so far of different is, is conditions and which things we see are associated with it. And again, I won't, I won't read you the whole list. You can kind of just scan through and look at it and see. But, you know, I mentioned about psoriasis. You know, we know that multiple sclerosis has been associated with reactions to Epstein-Barr virus, to Lyme disease, people that have, you know, irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or also colitis can be caused by mycobacteria, clostridia, Klebsiella, Saccharomyces, uh, people that get, you know, other arthritic conditions, Klebsiella, Lyme, yeast, foods, uh, interstitial cystitis. Uh, for any women who's tied in who have interstitial cystitis, I find a very strong correlation with candida. Uh, and we treat the LDI for candida and the symptoms get better almost inevitably. Uh, again, you can see that, you know, any of these conditions, you know, can be associated with different microbes. And, you know, fortunately, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of studies published on this association of microbes and the disease that they cause. So if you are really into research, you can go into the national database. It's called PubMed. It's a government run uh, database. And basically any study that gets published uh, will go into this database and you can search for terms. So you can go into PubMed, type any condition. You could type uh, encephalitis and molecular mimicry endometriosis and molecular mimicry, rheumatoid arthritis and molecular mimicry. But molecular mimicry is the key because then it'll pull any study that's ever been published that talks about those terms. But I found this is a really great way to try and help identify what is that association with different microbes and uh, a potential trigger. So I might have someone come in who has some condition that I think maybe there's a relationship and I may not be aware that there is any particular microbe that's known to cause it. You know, a very quick search will say, hey, you know what, they did a study, they found that H. pylori is associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So for someone with Hashimoto's disease, this may be a potential antigen that we want to work with. So again, for, for me as a doctor, it's a good way to kind of help see is there some other association that I'm not aware of? And of course, you as the patient or patient of a parent of a child that's dealing with this, it may give, you know, whoever you're working with, you know, other clues on, you know, what potential, an potential antigens you want to look at. So, you know, if you think about conventional treatment of PANS, 
And again, this is certainly not to knock it at all. I mean, it can work really well for a lot of kids, but you know, we've got kids on often long-term antibiotics. Sometimes we're doing steroids or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Motrin, uh, IVIG. You know, I think a lot of these therapies can be beneficial to help curtail the symptoms, but you know, we run into issues when these therapies are using long-term. Of course, the potential for side effects and having other problems kind of goes up. And at the end of the day, is it ultimately really changing the immune system in a way that will keep a child stable? I mean, my experience with, you know, PANS, PANDAS, is that a lot of kids, they go through these therapies, they get temporary relief. And then once they come off the therapy within a matter of days to weeks, we see regression and the symptoms start to come back again. So I think sort of the beauty of LDI is that there's at least that a potential that we can change the immune system in a more hopefully permanent way that we downregulate that response, we change the way the immune system's interacting and hopefully stop these symptoms completely. You know, how do we distinguish PANS from other illnesses that look like other conditions? You know, we know that conventional medicine tends to be kind of quick to dismiss PANS. I'm, I'm still gobsmacked at the number of pediatricians in particular that still <laughs> ignore PANS and tell you it doesn't exist, it's not a real thing. I don't know how much more evidence you need, but uh, again, you know, when you've got a child that's flaring and going through all the litany of symptoms, uh, more often than not, I see kids that have really been dismissed by conventional medicine, and they're not even given the option of antibiotics or NSAIDs or IVIG or any of these things. So, you know, what next? Again, you know, I, I'm not really talking about it tonight. There's certainly a lot of other things in the natural world between herbs and nutrients we can use to try and help mitigate PANS, but uh, LDI is something that I've used a lot and, again, have been quite successful in helping curtail a lot of these symptoms. You know, the nature of autoimmunity. Uh, it's not uncommon that infection is the initial trigger. And again, these infections may have happened, you know, months or even years prior to the onset of PANS. So don't, don't get in the mindset that it has to be something recent. Uh, again, I've seen people where, you know, as we trace their timeline, these, this infection happened, you know, again, a long time ago. And again, it may be at the time their immune system was healthier, it managed it, something changed, whether they had another infection, whether it was stress, whether it was a mold toxin exposure, you know, who knows. But that catalyst uh, allows that thing that was sitting in the background to no now come to the forefront, and now you've got a symptomatic child. Just for example, you know, Borrelia, this is the organism that causes Lyme disease. We've got studies that it cross-reacts with this thing called HLFA1, which is a, a, a white blood cell marker, uh, ECGF, ApoB100, and XNA2. These are associated with, you know, the brain. They're associated with connective tissue. Uh, we know that what's called the OSPA antigen, it's one of the markers we measure on a blood test for Lyme, is highly cross-reactive with a uh, flagellar protein that's like the little tail on the Lyme organism, and that cross-reacts with your peripheral nerves. So when people get numbness and tingling and nerve pain, you know, that can be a cross-reaction with the Lyme organism. So again, that's just one example of how these microbes can interact with their own tissue. And again, if you go through the research, you'll see that, you know, different bacteria, different viruses can affect different tissues. But again, that's why I think sometimes we see broader symptoms. So if you've got a child that's got PANS and they've got joint pain and they're having gastrointestinal problems and they're having skin rashes and they're having all these other things, we may find that, again, that autoimmune reaction isn't just causing PANS. It may be associated with other symptoms that they've been experiencing. So as I said before, you know, just treating the infection by itself won't necessarily stop that autoimmune response. And you can imagine, again, if this is something that's part of your normal flora, like strep, like candida, you're never going to completely get rid of it, right? I mean, it's part of you. You might get rid of it temporarily, but eventually you're going to, it's going to come back. So this idea that we can completely eradicate some of these bugs, it's just not true. And then the reality is, you know, you don't necessarily want to do that anyway. I mean, we need yeast. I mean, that is actually part of our beneficial flora, but it's about quantity. And so again, if we can curtail the quantity and change the way the immune system's reacting to it, that's really what makes the big difference. So, you know, antimicrobial therapy, whether it's antibiotics, herbs, they certainly help reduce the load of the microbe and that there's less stuff there that can be less stimulating to the immune system. So think about having a million organisms to deal with versus a hundred. Reducing the load can definitely help take that burden off the immune system. And again, I think that's why we see improvement with any kind of antimicrobial therapy. Same thing with anti-inflammatories. You can help reduce the inflammation. That certainly helps symptomatic, but it's not 
really addressing that underlying immune thing. So at the end of the day, again, a lot of these therapies we use don't fundamentally alter the immune reaction, nor do they build immune tolerance. So again, not uncommon for people to feel better while they're undergoing therapy, but symptoms often return shortly after discontinuing the therapy. And I've seen some doctors, they'll you know, keep altering their antibiotics, use different drugs, use different herbs. Uh, certainly with antibiotics, of course, I'm always very concerned about the long-term effect, particularly on the gut microbiome. You know, again, we just have so much research how important it is for healthy immune function. And you, know, you can't kill the bad stuff without killing the good stuff. I don't care how many probiotics you take, you can certainly keep someone from getting diarrhea, but that won't repopulate everything that's in the gut. You know, your gut contains, you know, hundreds, thousands of different species. You know, when you take a probiotic, you take three strains, five strains, 10 strains. It's a drop in the bucket relative to everything that your gut encounters. So I don't know that we'll ever completely get our entire healthy microbiome back when you've been on long-term antibiotics. So again, it's certainly uh, no, no gripe against antibiotics, but it's an awareness that as we keep altering gut microflora, you know, are we causing any other long-term issues and particularly your ability, your immune system's ability to function well. Remember, 80% of your immune function comes from the gut. So if the gut's not functioning well, it's gonna be very hard for your immune function to, to or immune system to function well. And when you look at the literature on any autoimmune disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, they all have an association with gut that's not working well. So it's just food for thought. So again, if we start treating PANS more like an autoimmune disease, less like infection, we get people better faster. Again, it's also important to look at the entire person. So LDI, again, is just one tool in our bag of tools where we're still dealing with allergies, sensitivities, gut health, you know, the terrain. The terrain is really critically important. And I think I could argue pretty successfully that most people with any chronic illness do not have a healthy terrain. And if you think about infection, I mean, you know, we're, we're obviously still coming out of, you know, COVID days. Uh, why is it you have some people that have COVID that got a sniffle, other people had no symptoms, and other people died? If we believe that the germ is relatively the same, I mean, obviously there's been variants over the last two and a half years, but if, if it's relatively the same bug, but we're seeing such dramatic differences in how it impacts people, is it the germ itself that's the problem or is it the terrain that allows that germ to be more opportunistic? So again, if we can create an environment, create a terrain that's not hospitable for these microbes taking over and causing these issues, uh, again, we get people healthier. So I, I don't want you thinking that, you know, we just give LDI and it works great. You know, we still have to address all these other underlying issues. And uh, if you've been in the, uh, I guess I'll say alternative medicine world for more than five minutes, we know how important gut health is. And I'm sure you've worked with your practitioners on doing everything to get your kids gut healthier. But again, it's critically important for helping maintain a healthy immune system. So again, LDI has been one of the few therapies I've been found really effective to churn off that overreaction to the different microbes. The effective dose is quite wide. It really depends on the antigen that we're using, but anywhere from 6C to 30C uh, seems to help. That does present one of the complications of LDI, the fact that it is such a wide range, trying to find what the target dose for each individual is can be a bit complicated. So again, it's like everything else. Everyone's individual, their needs are different. The dose that works beautifully for one may do nothing for the other. So I never compare one person to the other. Uh, it's just a recognition that often when we start this therapy, uh, we need to start often at a very weak dilution and then we can slowly increase as we feel like people tolerate it. Again, if you give the right antigen at the wrong dilution, what that means is that the dilution's too strong, often it will aggravate symptoms. And although, you know, as a parent, it honestly, it sucks when your child flares. From an LDI standpoint, it's not always a bad thing in that there's a bit of a diagnostic aspect of this therapy that if you give a dose and you see a negative reaction, it's also kind of proving that's the trigger. So if I give a child a strep 16C and their OCD gets worse, the anxiety gets worse, the tics get worse, Again, I've now just proven that strep is causing those symptoms. It's sort of confirmation that, yes, that is the trigger. Now I just need to find the right dose that's going to turn that reaction off, and I just need to give a weaker dilution next time. So, you know, I know Dr. Vincent, uh, if you've worked with him, you know, he has a slightly different approach. And again, it's not right or wrong. It's just different. I know he likes to use lower doses almost to kind of provoke you to see if it makes you worse, to prove that, yes, this is part of the problem, and then go back and start 
start getting weaker dilutions to find out what the right dilution is. I've got a different approach. I don't like to flare kids. I know how it is that when they get out of sorts, it can be really challenging. So I'd rather start with a weak dilution and then slowly increase if there's no response. So if we start at a 20C and after you know five, seven days, there's no reaction, then we can go to 19C. As those numbers go down, the concentration gets a little bit stronger. And if you do the math, each 1C difference is really only a 1% difference. So it is incrementally very small. And again, we can kind of get just inch our way up. So the downside to doing it that way is that it may take a little bit of time to figure out what the right dilution is. But the nice thing about it is that you are less likely to have any kind of negative reaction. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're, if you're going to prescribe a medication, if 100 milligrams is the target dose and you start at 1 milligram and then go to 5 milligrams and then 25 milligrams and then 50, you know, you're inch your way up. Make sure that people tolerate it. You're just less likely to overshoot the mark and have any kind of negative reaction. So, again, if you give the dose after, you know, 10 days, and it could be really anywhere from 7 to 10 days, uh, and you don't really see any difference at all, then you can give the next strongest dilution. Once you figure out what the target dilution is, then it's given every seven weeks. So what's really interesting is when you've hit the target dose, usually you'll see a change within the first day or two. So I always tell parents, I'm like, you know, watch out, especially that first 48 hours after you give the dose, really monitor your child, make sure they're not going, you know, to a sleep away or at a friend's house or another relative, you know, you really want to keep a close eye on them so you can monitor what changes because sometimes that change, particularly if it's positive, it may only last for a day or two. It may be fairly short lived. And it's very easy to say, well, you know, yeah, they were better for a day or two, but you know what, they went right back to square one after that. That's actually a good sign. It's not uncommon that the first time you give it, even if it's the right dilution, that the benefit only lasts for, you know, a short period of time. But then the second time you give it, it lasts longer. The third time you give it, it lasts longer. And each subsequent dose, if it's the right dose, the benefit lasts longer and longer. So, you know, this does become a little bit of a long-term uh, treatment. It's not like you give one dose, the child gets better, and then you never have to give a dose again. More often than not, you know, people are in therapy for often many months and sometimes even years to, you know, get to a point where you don't need to give it anymore. But I've gotten people to a point where, yeah, they were getting dose every seven weeks. And then when they get to the point at seven weeks, you know, seven weeks is kind of the minimum. And the reason it's seven weeks is that it takes seven weeks for new T cells to enter your circulation. So we're always kind of retraining a new group of T cells to learn what it should be doing correctly. Now, I think of it like boot camp, right? You know, you go to boot camp, if you're in the army, you go seven weeks of basic training and then you're off and then the new recruit comes in, seven weeks of basic training and they're off. Kind of the same thing. We're always trying to re-educate this new population of T cells to function the way that we want. We can give booster doses in between. So sometimes what happens is we give a dose, we see a positive reaction, but after three weeks, four weeks, parents say, you know what, I see them slipping, they're starting to regress, they're having symptoms again. It's too early to give them their full dose, but we can give them a very small amount of that dose, we call a booster dose, and sometimes that's enough just to carry them through until we can get them to a point where we can give them a full dose. Uh, we have all tried, if anyone's been doing this therapy for a while, at some point tried giving the dose too soon. It tends to make things worse, so we found that that seven-week rule really can't be broken, at least successfully. So with PANS in particular, although, of course, there's numerous microbes out there that can be potential triggers, the ones I find come up over and over. And again, even if we never did any testing at all, if I were just randomly guessing, you know, strep, group A strep in particular, Borrelia, the organism causes Lyme, mycoplasma, clostridia, candida, and Epstein-Barr, they come up over and over. So we have some cases where, you know, we don't have any lab work, we can't get lab work for any reason. So again, if we have it, it's great. Might give some clues of where we want to start. But I have a few people that for various reasons, we don't have that. And it's educated guessing, for lack of a better word. But uh, I find, you know, strep and Lyme out of everything are probably the top two. Uh, but I've had some kids that respond very well to clostridia, mycoplasma, and so forth. So again, it's been very effective at helping reduce a lot of pan symptoms, you know, whether they are on, on antibiotics already or if they're not on antibiotics. So if your child's already on antibiotics, they're already on IVIG or some other therapy, it doesn't mean you can't do this. Uh, it does become a little bit of a timing issue, particularly if you're on IVIG. 
I don't like to give this, you know, particularly right after they've had their IVIG infusions. So the rule is you need to be two weeks out from your IVIG infusions. And then that two weeks, because most kids are getting it once a month. We've got that two week window. We can play with LDI, see how they react and not have to worry about the IVIG interfering. Uh, there are times, again, you know, where ticks, many of these other symptoms become so debilitating. Again, antibiotics can be used short term just to reduce that load. But again, if this is something that's part of your normal flora, we're never going to get rid of it. So we've got to find a workaway around it. And again, LDI has been that workaround. Uh, and again, when you hit the nail on the head, you know, the right antigen, right dilution, I've seen ticks, anxiety, OCD, a lot of these classic symptoms go away within a matter of days and sometimes shorter. So it can be quite profound, uh, almost to the point you don't believe it. Uh, again, I've had the experience where sometimes it doesn't last, but again, as a parent, at least you know you're on the right track of, you know, okay, this is the right antigen. This is definitely the thing that's contributing to it. You may find in some cases it's not just one trigger. There may be more than one thing. So if you give strep and there's a 50% reduction in symptoms, okay, well, maybe the other 50% is due to Lyme or something else. So we do get in cases where often we're using multiple antigens. We're not just using one. And again, it's not uncommon. So don't be surprised if you start this, you use one antigen, you get some benefit. It doesn't cause complete resolution. You may find that you need to work with other antigens to see if that moves your child you know, a little bit further. So once you give a dilution, really important that you keep good records. Where this therapy goes sideways is when uh, parents, uh, they don't keep track of when they gave their child the dilution, what happened. You know, I'll be on the phone sometimes or talking with a parent like, well, when did you give it? Oh, I don't really remember. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Okay, what happened? Uh, you know, maybe they were better. You know, that, that vague report doesn't help me, doesn't help your child. So really important if you're gonna do this therapy, keep a log, keep it on your phone, write exactly the date, the time that you gave it, really track them, especially that two days, that 48 hours after they get it. But really for five days, you wanna keep an eye because some kids do have a delayed reaction. Uh, and then really after 10 days, if there's just no change whatsoever, then again, we could potentially go and give the next strongest dilution. In our office, we have a thing through our medical record system where people are no, five days after they give their child a dose, they message my office, it goes right into the portal, it's in their chart, I can see what they, they, how they reacted and I can quickly message back, hey, this was a great dilution, we'll use it next time, or no, this was the wrong thing, we need to give a stronger dilution. So it's a really easy way for us to communicate, but it's just important, again, that you keep good records on this. Otherwise, you're gonna get horribly confused and that doesn't help anyone. So again, you know, if it's not the right antigen, you may find that you go through a series of dilutions and just nothing happens. So kind of the worst case scenario, if it's not the right bug, is you know outside of having spent time and money you know giving different dilutions it won't do anything you know i've had some people where we think lime is their biggest thing we go through six eight different lime dilutions nothing changes at all you know it's a pretty good indicator that lime isn't the bigger part of the picture you may have evidence on paper that they've been exposed to lime but if you go through all these dilutions and nothing changes that may just not be the culprit Again, once you find the right dilution, the optimal dilution, give it to every seven, eight weeks. Seven weeks is the minimum. Uh, again, I mentioned some people will feel better just for a very brief period of time if it is the right uh, dilution, uh, but we still don't want to give another dose into the seven weeks. Too soon can definitely flare things and that makes things worse. Uh, the booster dose, uh, just to expand a little further on that, uh, the way that I give it now is I will give someone, if, if 18C, like Lyme 18C, if that was the right dilution, uh, we usually use 0.04 of the extract. So it's really only about a drop to a drop and a half, and we squirt it under the tongue. It's a really small volume. Uh, for the booster, instead of 0.04, I'll just use 0.01. Uh, what we used to do uh, in the old days is we would give one dilution weaker. So if 18C was the right dilution, we would give a 19C as a booster. And I wasn't finding that was working as well. Uh, so I find if I just give like 25% of the dilution that worked, it's not so much that it aggravates people, but it's enough just to push them in the right direction. And I have some people that will do multiple boosters. Again, if they kind of fall apart after week three, they'll give a booster at week three. They might give a booster at week five, and then we give them the full dose at week seven. So this, this might sound more complicated than it really is, but these booster doses you can use more frequently if needed. I have one patient that found, for whatever reason, they were giving their child a booster every week. 
I've only had to do that with one person. It just seemed to sustain them until they got to their next dilution. And eventually got to a point where they didn't have to give so many boosters. It stabilized their immune system. But by and large, you know, if people do need boosters, usually it's one, maybe two, rarely two in between their seven week period. But just know you do have that option that if things start to shift between that seven week period, there is a way to help mitigate that. I mentioned that people get worse flare on it. Uh, you do need to wait till that flare goes away before you give another dilution or antigen. Uh, most of these flares man, usually last for a few days to a week. It's pretty rare that they last longer than that. Uh, again, usually we'll use Motrin or we use some sort of natural anti-inflammatory like curcumin if they tolerate it just to help to get the inflammation down. We use bicarbonate formula. Alkalizing the body works really well to kind of stop the inflammation. So there are ways, again, to mitigate it if there is a negative reaction. But fortunately, uh, most of these reactions are fairly short-lived. And then people are just kind of back to their baseline. So it's really rare. Uh, and I've heard this from other practitioners, other people, that they did LDI. They seem to have a major, major aggravation that lasted longer you know, it's always hard to know, was it the LDI that did it? Was it something else? My experience with LDI is that's extremely rare to see this long-standing flare that can't get controlled. And certainly with a lot of my Lyme patients, it's always hard to know because a lot of Lyme patients, they have periodic flares anyway and may have had nothing to do with LDI. So by and large, you know, most of these aggravations, if they do happen, are fairly short-lived. Again, often we can mitigate with anti-inflammatories or bicarbonate formula, but in terms of going forward, you know, we want to wait at least seven weeks before we even try another dilution. So if we gave them a Lyme 16C, they got worse, then we have to wait seven weeks before we consider giving them a Lyme 20C or 22C. Uh, now, potentially, we can use another antigen if we're going to do strep. We can just wait until they calm down and then start the strep. But I wouldn't give the same antigen shorter than that seven-week period if they've had an aggravation. Again, you just need to be an active participant in the process. Give good data to your, your doctor. Make sure that you're giving good uh, representation of what your child's experiencing. Again, that really helps us understand, was it the right dilution, the wrong dilution, right antigen, wrong antigen? And all of this is just a constant fine-tuning to make sure that we have the right antigen, right dilution. I also recommend not to start any new therapy when you're getting the LDI doses. You know, most of my patients, they're not just doing LDI. Of course, they're doing a ton of other things. And if you start a new treatment at the same time, particularly if there's an aggravation, we won't know is it the LDI or is it something else that you started. So it's not that you can't do other things, just don't do it at the same exact time. So again, if you're gonna do IVIG, do the IV, IVIG, wait two weeks, then do LDI. If you're gonna start a new supplement, maybe start the supplement, give it a week or two, then do the LDI. So just make sure you space things out enough so that you have a clear understanding of how your child's reacting to it. Uh, let me just give you a couple of cases, an example. This is an eight-year-old uh, white male that he had new onset uh, of motor and vocal tics. Uh, his neck was twitching, facial movements, and he kept making kind of this hmm, 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 you know, vocal tic sound. He had a history of allergies, but really wasn't complaining of any like seasonal allergy symptoms at the time. And he was otherwise physically well. So I did a standard blood panel, you know, blood count, metabolic panel, ASO and DNSB, DNSB are strep uh, markers, checked his thyroid. Uh, the lab showed that everything was normal, but he did have very high uh, markers for strep. So I figured, okay, this is pretty classic pandas, right? You know, overnight OCD anxiety ticks. So I gave him a strep 10C. And after a couple of weeks, mom said the ticks were a little bit less noticeable, but they hadn't gone away. Uh, I tried giving him a strep 11C as a booster to see if it would further help his ticks. Uh, after the booster, it really didn't change at all. So when I'm talking to mom, she's like, you know, uh, four years ago, he had Lyme. And I was living in Connecticut at the time, by the way. And if you don't know, Lyme disease is named after Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, he had, you know, Lyme four years ago. He was treated with antibiotics. And as far as mom was concerned, you know, Lyme was done. It really wasn't part of the picture. And I said, well, why don't we try the Lyme 12C and see what happens? And that night she had a call and she said he had a really bad headache. Uh, we managed it kind of naturally with homeopathics and some other things. And the following day, the ticks completely went away, like 100% gone. Uh, after six months, I only had to repeat his Lyme 12C once. Motor vocal ticks virtually subsided. All the other symptoms, you know, pretty much went away. 
I did try continuing with strep to see if it had any other impact. We went all the way down to 60, nothing really ever changed. So, you know, for me, this was a great example that I think what happened is he had this Lyme in the background, he got strep, he got exposed to strep, and although he didn't really get strep throat or strep, it was a catalyst to allow this Lyme that had probably been lurking in the background for a while to come forward and trigger pants. So again, this is where I got completely bamboozled. Everything on paper suggested this should have been a strep case, and really it was Lyme that made the biggest difference more than the strep. This is another kid I'm still working with. Uh, at the time he was 14 years old, he's on the spectrum, has psoriasis, but he also had aggressive behavior, social problems, difficulty in school. He has what's called plaque psoriasis, which is different than guttate psoriasis. Most psoriasis out there is plaque where it's just kind of all over the body and it just looks like it spreads. Guttate psoriasis is where you get these kind of coin looking like lesions, so it's a little bit different. Uh, it was actually referred to me for identifying and treating food allergies. We found that he had a lot of food allergies, so we started him on elimination diet, and SLIT stands for sublingual immunotherapy. In our practice, we desensitize people against very specific kinds of food phenolics, and so that's what we started with him. And he initially did well with the foods. His behavior got better, more calm, socially engaged, but his psoriasis really didn't change. So I started him on a strep 18C, uh, and again, really no change. So we kept going down in dilution every 10 days. And after taking the 16C, we did see some improvement in his psoriasis. So he received four more doses over the course of seven months. Skin slightly improved, but then it really kind of plateaued. It didn't get better and occasionally it would flare. So then realizing that staph can sometimes be as much of a trigger as strep, I gave him a staph 16C and there was huge improvement in his skin. Uh, he's now received, at least at the time, he has received three doses of staph 16C with a few boosters between and his skin almost completely cleared up. So I wanna show you, uh, the pictures on here are all of his pictures prior to getting uh, the LDI for staph. And you can see it's on his legs, his ankles, he's got lesions on his back. And after he got the staph, uh, unfortunately I didn't have all his pictures, but this is his legs. You can see it's almost completely clear. Um, at this point, this is now, uh, since this last picture was taken, the first pictures were 2017. Uh, it's now 2022, so it's five years later. He still gets the staph LDI. He still has psoriasis. It never went away 100%, but we've been able to uh, manage it, and it's it's markedly improved. So I still think he has other triggers, and we continue to kind of work on it. And uh, we have tried other antigens to see if it made a difference. It didn't, but the staph definitely had a profound effect. And I have used staph with other patients with plaque psoriasis and have seen very similar results. And this last case uh, is just a 22-year-old male with moderate autism. And uh, he was diagnosed when he was two years old and he was very severely impacted. I did not know him at this time. He had worked with a doctor out here in California that retired and we had took over his practice. So by the time I met him, it's 20 years after he had been through treatment. And the doctor he had worked with is an environmental medicine doctor, got his gut healthy. So, I mean, he had made a lot of progress over the 20 years, did behavior therapy, I mean, all these other things, uh, gluten-free, casein-free diet, hyperbaric, B12, you know, all the standard biomedical therapy and everything like always helped a little bit. Uh, at 10 years old, he had very minimal expressive language, few one to two, two word sentences, had a lot of stereotypic behaviors, but his stooling was better, his behavior was better. Uh, he really had no social interest other than being with his parents. Again, he was physically well, but still quite impaired. And really over the next 10 years, there really wasn't any drastic change. Again, he didn't get sick, you know, he had good poops, energy was good, slept well. So again, physically he was doing quite well. And again, they had tried other therapies and again, nothing really ever made a big difference. The problem now is he's getting older, he's more sedentary, he's not active, he's becoming overweight, he's eating a lot, and he's a big guy. I mean, I'm six foot two and he's a good, you know, three, four inches taller than me. So he's six five, six six. I think at the time I first met him, he was six five, six six, and he weighed about almost 300 pounds, 280 pounds, I think. So overweight, even for his size. Uh, so uh, the doctor retired, so we started dealing with, again, food sensitivities, phenolics, 
uh, started him on subluminal immunotherapy. And even after six weeks, we started seeing him lose weight. And again, I've seen this in my practice that even getting away from food sensitivities, you lose a lot of water weight, metabolically things start to shift. And his awareness started to improve a little bit, more responsive to his name and commands. Uh, so we're always seeing a little bit of improvement just by addressing some of these food issues. Uh, again, after three months, we kind of hit a plateau, his progress stopped. So we tested him for different infections and he tested positive for strep, candida. He had this kind of equivocal Lyme test. He's born and raised out here in California, but we now know that California is a state that's endemic for Lyme, you know, just as much as Connecticut. So uh, we started him on LDI. Uh, we started him on Lyme 12C, strep 12C, candida 12C. We did not do them all at the same time. They were done sequentially, but uh, to be honest, at the time, I'm forgetting now why I did all of them at the same time, but that's what we did. And what was really fascinating, though, is that even after 48 hours of starting uh, the LDI, and uh, I, I'd have to go back in my notes, I can't remember what we started with. I think we started with the Lyme, though. I think we did them in the order of their list. I think we did Lyme, then five days later we did Strap, five days later we did Candida. So even after Lyme, mom says his expressive language was actually starting to improve. Over the next six weeks, his language continued to improve, starting to use now three to five word sentences, much more awareness, much more interaction. So he received another dose of LDI again seven weeks after the first dose. We keep seeing improvements in his language, more meaningful language now, and he started expressing abstract thought, which he had never done before. Uh, he continued to get LDI over the course of a year. Uh, we ended up adding mycoplasma at 1.10C. And after nine months of starting LDI, he actually had enough awareness and language, called a friend on the phone and invited him to go see Alvin and the Chipmunks at the movie theater. I remember it was around Christmas time. And uh, mom was just blown away that he had the awareness, the forethought, knew how to call his friend, who also, by the way, is on the spectrum. And the two of them went and apparently had a great time. Uh, but now he's starting to have conversations with family, with friends, much greater awareness. Uh, and over time, now this has now been many years, uh, he is now almost, I think he's 29 now, and uh, he's got a part-time job, he works at Trader Joe's, uh, it's actually kind of funny, mom was telling me he got a job at Trader Joe's, supervised, and his first job was to collect shopping carts out in the parking lot. And uh, one of the employees came and says, um, I think he needs a little bit more supervision. He kept running into cars with the carts because he wasn't paying attention. And of course, scratching up people's cars is probably not a good thing. So he needs a little bit more supervision that you can't just bump into cars. But uh, you know, he, he works in now in stocking and bagging and all the people there love him and he loves them. And he's got like a life. Now he's still on the spectrum. You know, I, I don't know, honestly, that he'll ever be independent, probably not, but his quality of life and the quality of life for his family, his parents, is just so different now that, you know, he has a job that he can go to and be gone most of the day and be supervised, it gives, you know, mom and dad time to go do things for them. So it, it's just been a, a great reminder for me, too, that even at this age, you know, language can change. I think, you know, we some people have the feeling that, you know, you get to a point where the brain hardwires and what you got is what you got. And it just shows the neuroplasticity of the brain that even at, you know, 20 plus years old, he's still gaining language. And uh, again, you know, if I see him in the office, hi, Dr. Ingalls, how are you? You know, he says, hello, I say hi back. And there's, you know, minimal conversation, but at least there's some conversation that's much more meaningful. So sort of the highlights of LDI, again, this can be very effective at undoing that autoimmune reaction that these bugs cause. Labs sometimes give us clues where we need to start. Really not about killing the bug, just about modulating the immune system. And to be honest, there's very few therapies that do that. I've seen some very impressive results, but again, if the dose is too strong, you can see a worsening. That's not always a bad thing. It may tell you you're on the right track. You just got the wrong dilution. Doses do need to spa be spaced out so you know how it's affecting each child. Every seven weeks is the rule for the same antigen. Again, you can use multiple antigens simultaneously. Just make sure you space them apart so you know how they're reacting. And again, just be cautious when you're starting new therapies as LDI. Otherwise, it's really difficult to know what's helping them. Uh, if you're interested, I wrote a book called The Lyme Solution. The book is obviously around Lyme disease, but I do have a section in there that talks more specifically about low-dose immunotherapy if you guys are interested. And on that note, let, let's uh, jump into some of the questions. Okay. I highly suggest that book. It's a very good one. Um, I've 
referred to it many times and gone back to it. Um, so we got some questions before the talk and I'm going to start off with those and then look into some of the chat ones. Um, sure. So, and of course you've answered a bunch of them <laughs> during the course of your talk. So, um, so are there any contra indications to even start using LDM? LDI? I'm sorry, LDI. <laughs> I know, we got too many acronyms, LDI, LDN. Uh, yeah, not really. I mean, the only time that I'd say you have to be careful with low-dose immunotherapy is someone's on steroids. Because okay. steroids or anything that's an immune suppressive therapy, the fact that we are trying to modulate the immune system, at least in theory, if you're on any kind of immune suppressive therapy, there's a good chance that it won't work. So if someone's on, you know, high doses of steroids for a flare or for any other reason, then I would wait until the, the steroids cleared out of the system. But if you've got someone who's on like a steroid inhaler for asthma, that's not usually problematic, um, but it's really more of the high dose steroids. But other than that, no, that's really the only other contraindication. Again, it's just a function then of spacing out from other therapies, which isn't a contraindication. It's just a, a tip to make sure you're doing it correctly. Right. And I mean, that same logic of spacing out your therapies can be used for a lot of different modalities of treatments. Um, and so when you were talking about in your lecture, you said if they do go into a bit of flare because the dose might have been too high, one of the things you do give is a steroid. So that's why, because you're trying to suppress that reaction, right? Uh, that certainly not my preference. I mean, I'd rather use Motrin than going into a steroid. Yeah. I, I've only had one person in my practice that, you know, and the uh, ibuprofen didn't work. They really needed steroids because they were really injuring themselves and very aggressive. But by and large, I mean, again, you can use things like curcumin. You can use bicarbonate. They work often really well. With curcumin, I find you have to use a pretty high dose of it to get the anti-inflammatory benefits. But if push comes to shove, I mean, Motrin's widely available and often kids do respond favorably. So if you need to use Motrin for a couple of days just to calm things down, uh, particularly again, if they're you know harming themselves, aggressive towards other people, um, you know it's it, it's a way. But yeah, we try and do it as natural as possible. But uh, again, fortunately, these aggravations tend to be relatively short lived. Okay. Do you ever treat um, Bartonella with LDI? Absolutely. Yeah. What about um, Borrelia? Borne illnesses, Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia. Uh, we actually use a mix that has Lyme and all the co-infections in one mix, and then we have them as individual antigens. So I have some people that do really well on the mix with everything. I have other people that we have to give them just the straight Bartonella. But yeah, I've seen really good results for, you know, burning neuropathy and um, joint pain and, you know, really any of the number of other symptoms that we see with tick-borne illness, you know, can improve with LDI. Okay. Um and speaking of that neuropathy with the Lyme, you mentioned that um, the band 41 and the neuropathy, you often see that go to hand in hand. And a lot of times we, I hear the parents talk a lot about, oh, or even a lot of doctors, oh, you don't really have to pay attention to that band 41. And so I was like, oh, there's that band 41 meaning something. So I just thought maybe. Yeah. Well, band 41 is not unique to Lyme. I mean, that's from a diagnostic standpoint, 41 doesn't mean anything because, again, it's a flagellar protein. You have a lot of bugs in your body that make flagellar protein. So in theory, these other microbes that make a flagellar antibody, that 41 antibody, may not be Lyme, but potentially could interfere with your nerves. But the study I was referencing was very specific to Lyme. They did show that Lyme, because that 41 antibody, did potentially cause problems with peripheral nerves. Okay. But yeah, if you uh, test everyone out there in the world, like 80% of the population will have a 41 antibody. Okay, good to know. Thanks for that. Um, so you talked about how you space the dose, like you give for 10 days, if it doesn't do anything, how many 10 days does one, how, how many um, concentrations will you go up before you say, all right, maybe we should try a different one? So for most bacterial antigens or even viral antigens, you know, usually if we get down to 6C, maybe even 5C, if there's no change at that point, then that's it, we're done. And how many times is it to get to that number? Maybe Depends five. where you start. Okay. <laughs> you start at 18C, you know, you might go through 12 dilutions to get there. 
Okay, so I can take it. So I, when I tell people, like, when you're starting this, I say, you know, it may be three months, three to four months to really figure out which antigens, which dilution. Again, I would never hang my hat assuming it's one antigen. So you may find it takes a while to work through one antigen and then you need to work with the second. And if you're doing multiple antigens. So again, don't go into this thinking that you're going to figure it out in a week or two. It may take you several months to figure out what the right antigen is, what the right dilution. But, you know, once you do figure that out, again, it does give you an opportunity to really help, you know, shift the immune system in a positive way. Okay. So if a family is starting out and they don't have, say, a confirmed primary immune deficiency, that would definitely, you know, most people would start to do an IVIG on. Yeah. What, what, version, what would you want them to do the IVIG or do you think they should try the LDI first or is there a... Yeah, I, I would always advocate for trying LDI first. For me, IVIG, in my practice anyway, is sort of a last resort therapy. You know, as, as well as it works for a lot of people, you know, it is a blood product and like any blood product that comes with risk. And as much as they screen the blood supply, you never know what might sneak through. So always a potential risk. And not to mention it's the expense and of course, trying to get IVIG covered. Many insurance companies don't cover it, even if you've got you know, proof that there's immune deficiency. So I know which is what a haggle it is to get it covered anyway, where, you know, LDI is pretty straightforward. You know, you're working with a practitioner who does this and understands it. It's an easier start. And again, sometimes, and more often than not, we get to a point where we never really need IVIG. I mean, I've got one patient in my practice right now where, again, we've cycled through different LDIs. It really hasn't helped at all. And I'm like at the point where I think you need IVIG. I mean, you need something because he's having a lot of issues, very aggressive, and he's big. So, you know, we need to get peace in the household. Uh, and this is now a way to do it. But, you know, by and large, you know, I, I find that LDI is a safer way to approach it. Um, so that would be my preference. Um can you use LDI if you're still living in mold? Well, LDI is not. So I, if you're following Dr. Vincent, I think uh, we've, we've got a nomenclature problem. He's now calling everything LDI because in his practice, he treats mold and food and a bunch of other environmentals. I think he still calls it LDI. In my world, LDI is very specific for microbes. Okay. LDA is what we use when we're treating food and mold. So you can do LDA. I mean, you can still treat, uh, you know, uh, the sensitivity to mold if you're still in a moldy environment. But understand, like with mold in particular, you can be allergic to mold spores. That's one problem. That's what LDA works really well for. If you have mycotoxicity, it does nothing for mycotoxicity. Mycotoxins are chemicals. It's not an immune problem. It's a chemical problem. And immunotherapy isn't going to do anything for a chemical problem. It's kind of like if you get poisoned by, you know, someone puts cyanide in your food, you can't use immunotherapy to fix that. Uh, when you get chemicals in your body that get into certain tissues and damage the tissue, that's not primarily an immune problem. So, yeah, I think people sometimes confuse mold allergy with mycotoxicity. They're two completely different problems related to mold and two completely different treatments. Okay. Great to know. Thank you. Um, so then does it matter what kind of mold you have in your house? Like, you know, you can do the test of the different molds that are in your system or what, or, or is that because a mycotoxicity issue? Yeah, mycotoxicity, again, that's a different problem. Okay. So again, you know, uh, for people that have mycotoxins, you know, well, of course, A, you need to you know find where it's coming from. You need to get it cleaned up. Sometimes you have to throw out a bunch of your stuff. Uh, but again, the way that you address that, now you've got to figure out how to get mycotoxins out of tissue. You've got to detoxify. That's really, again, a detoxification issue where, yeah. you know, people that have mold allergy, that's an immune reaction to mold spores. So very, very different. And then you definitely do want to get out of living in that moldy environment. As much as possible. Continue to react to it. Um, okay. So can, do you find that, treating these microbes with LDI will help with the fatigue. Absolutely. I mean, any number of different symptoms, joint pain, fatigue, I can speak personally, you know, I mean, having had Lyme disease, I did the Lyme LDI, of course, it was long after I had Lyme disease, and it never really did anything for me. But I did the Candida LDI, literally the next day brain fog was gone. 
I didn't even know that that was the problem. I was just playing around with it. And uh, yeah, Candida 10C. And the next day the brain fog was lifted and that was it. I was one and done. I haven't had to redo it since. So uh, sometimes again, you can see these things change quite rapidly and, you know, fatigue is one of them. You know, fatigue is one of those symptoms that's associated with, you know, a gazillion different things, but uh, it is very possible, particularly if it's due to a, uh, a microbe that if you find the right microbe that that would help. But I do see a lot of patients where their fatigue does get better um, when they, uh, they do LDI. Right. So when you are looking at testing, are, you know, in the PANS world, PANDA's world, most of the, an infectious doctor is generally always looking at the IgM, the current active yeah. infection versus the IgG, the past infection. So do you look at both since you're looking at what's happening now versus what's been in the system for a long time? Yeah, I mean, I look at both. I mean, understand when you're doing any kind of serology, you know, an antibody testing for a bug, all you're really trying to identify is that have you had exposure? You know, this idea that IgM is acute or active, IgG is old past, you know, it's not completely true. You can have IgG that might be a sign that an infection is more active. Uh, IgM, like especially with Lyme, can come and go over the years. So for me, particularly with PANS, it's really just a way of trying to identify what have you been exposed to. Again, whether you're IgM positive, IgG positive, it still doesn't prove that's what's bothering you. But mm -hmm. as a way with starting LDI of kind of identifying, is this part of the problem? Where do we need to start? Again, it just may be a clue. And I guess some people, we do all the testing, nothing comes back. It still doesn't stop me from doing LDI. I mean, yeah. I'll still do it based on clinically because we know that, you know, any antibody test is still dependent on how well your immune system identifies the bug and reacts. And if you're immune suppressed or for whatever reason, your body thinks it's part of you or, you know, if it's part of your normal flora, your immune system may not react at all because it says, I know it's part of you, but that doesn't mean that strep or candida is not still causing an autoimmune problem. When we measure antibodies in blood, we're not measuring autoimmune antibodies necessarily. So uh, again, it'd be very easy to think that uh, because all the tests are normal, that that's not part of the, the trigger. But we find clinically that sometimes people respond to these antigens even when their tests show that they're quote normal. So if you have a new patient and you're sort of starting at square one and they don't have a lot of past paperwork and past lab tests, will you run a whole bunch of labs and will some of those labs be specialty labs like an Igenix Lyme or do you just treat? Yeah, I mean, we try and run as much as we can through the conventional labs because insurance pays for it. If right. I suspect someone has tick-borne illness, I'll use medical diagnostic labs because you know insurance pays for them too and they do very comprehensive testing. If someone needs an organic acid test, we're trying to measure like clostridia, other yeast markers. So again, it kind of depends on each person and what we think we need to look out for. But I, I try to get as much information, again, if we're going to do LDI, just so we're not completely guessing, but sometimes it is your best educated guess. Um, is there an LDI for COVID-19? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we don't, I shouldn't take it. I, I'm not sure if we have it. We were trying to get it. You know, part of the problem is trying to find these antigens. And uh, I suppose theoretically, if you had someone that had active COVID, you could probably isolate it from them. But uh, theoretically, yes. I have heard of other practitioners who have been using it. I'm not sure where they're sourcing it from. I know that Dr. Vincent provides the antigens for most practitioners using uh, LDI. So he may very well have an antigen and it would make sense, particularly for people with long COVID to try it, see if it makes a difference. Yeah, one of the questions from a doctor here out on the East Coast, she wanted to know what are um, reputable dispensaries for LDI? Well, there is no dispensary. Uh, this is all done by practitioners who do it. We all do it in our office. So any practitioner does LDI, all these are made up in, in your office. So okay. yeah, there's no central dispensary. You can just write a prescription like other things and get it filled. Um, what about using LDI while on um, plasmapheresis for autoimmune encephalitis? Again, I just wouldn't use it probably around the time that you're getting your plasmapheresis treatment, but yeah, in theory it would make sense. If you're using plasmapheresis as a detox, uh, I would probably wait at least a week after getting the treatment to do the LDI, but yeah, you could do them together. And then um, do you see patients virtually? Yes, we do. We do.
lots and lots. That is sort of your mainstay. Um, I see a question here about uh, does LDI treatment improve executive function skills, ADHD, the developed Dupans? Yeah. I mean, again, as you get neural inflammation under control, it has the potential to affect all that. I've seen other kids, yeah, with just straight up ADD that don't even have PANS. Uh, sometimes, you know, they respond favorably to LDI. So, again, it may be something worth trying, again, particularly if you know that they have a history of previous infection, or again, you've done other lab work and identified that, you know, there is um, some sort of underlying microbe. And I see Abby asked here, are the effects permanent or do patients need to continue for years, forever? Uh, again, a lot of our patients, I'll say months to to years, years being, you know, sometimes two years, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they need it every seven weeks during that time. Again, if we get to a point where they get to the seven week mark and they're doing well, then I said, don't, don't take the dose. You may not need it. But if they get to 16 weeks, 18 weeks, 24 weeks, now they're starting to have symptoms. Okay, let's give another dose. So now getting it every seven weeks, well, now they're getting it every three months, every four months. So you may find that you can space it out further and really at that point, give it kind of as needed. Uh, so I've got a lot of patients now that they may get it once or twice a year. And again, the goal is to try and get the, the effect to be permanent. Uh, but of course, there's all the other moving parts, you know, that affect your terrain, stress, diet, gut health. So making sure that we're covering the bases and all these other things is really important. Um, and I kind of answered this question, but I'll ask it because it's a slightly different way. If a patient has a diagnosis of um, tongue twister, is LDI a better treatment or a in conjunction treatment to say IVIG for that condition? Well, I mean, it depends on whether the hypogamma globulinemia is acquired or if it's genetic. Uh, if it's genetic, you know, that's a little bit different. Uh, again, I think when you're talking about immune modulation, that's going to probably work either way. Um, it's a, it, you know, again, it's a different mechanism, uh, particularly if it's genetic. So something like selective IgA deficiency, which is a genetic, you know, thing where you just don't make IgA and therefore you're more prone to getting sick. I mean, LDI is not going to fix that. It's genetic. Right. Uh, but a lot of these immune deficiencies are acquired, and in which case I think, you know, LDI still potentially works. But again, if you've got someone who's truly immune deficient and, you know, L or IVIG is indicated, you can do both. You just need to space them out. Great. And so I think we've answered all the questions that came into the chat and into prior to our talk. So um, call it a night, but thank you so much for um, spending the evening with us and taking time out to speak to, with everybody at Aspire and our community. We really appreciate your time and efforts and all you do to uh, continue to educate, not just the Aspire community, but all the other communities out there. Um, and we learned so much from you and um, you've helped so many patients that it's just wonderful to have you here. And thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Gabriella. Okay. See you soon. <laughs>